Thank you and uh, good afternoon everyone. I hope you had a lovely lunch and that it hasn't uh, made you tired and sleepy, um, but you feel uh, energized for a discussion on this absolutely crucial topic of the just transition. I recently stepped down as the co-chair of the banking board in UNEP5 and have spent the last 10 years um, working on principles for responsible banking and other work um, under the, the UNEP5 banner. So it's very nice for me to be back amongst friends and what I consider family um, at this event. And one of the themes I think already we've heard from this morning's um, discussions and speeches is just transition. And I think just transition is a concept that we know about, we've heard about, and we support. I don't think you would find anyone who would say we're not supporting a just transition. But the difficulty is how do we turn the just transition into practice? And how do we operationalize it as financial institutions? That's the next step that we need to take. And we have a wonderful panel of um, experts with us today who are going to share their thoughts, their thinking, their experience with operationalizing and making practical the concept of a just transition. We know that the energy transition, decarbonization, is going to impact everyone because we need economy-wide, society-wide changes. But to affect those changes, we need public support. And the public care about things like rising energy costs, energy security, whether they might lose their jobs, um, the impact of building wind turbines um, near their homes, etc. So these are things that we have to take into consideration in making sure that we can actually implement the measures needed to reach net zero. We also need to think about the impact on traditional communities, indigenous peoples, and what it means to their traditional ways of life as well. Um, what does it mean for people's human rights that are affected by the transition? So what I'm going to do is ask each of our panelists in turn, in the order that they, they're seated here um, this afternoon, to give a very quick one minute, I know one minute is difficult, but quick one minute on what you think the just transition means in the context of financial services. So, Peter, if we could start with you, please. Sure. Thank you very much for, for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak uh, at this very, very interesting panel. So maybe just let's start with one major sentence. Perhaps if we don't get the transition just, we just don't get the transition, or we get it in a very limited way. And I think it's quite crucial uh, for many reasons, because simply we won't get sufficient support, it will be difficult to get delivered, because when we talk about transition in general, we often focus on costs and difficulty and challenges. So I think in general, if we add the just element to it, we actually might make it more, uh, more likely that it will happen. So I think it's, it's important to remember that. Looking from financial institution perspective or investor, um, I think what is really important is that if we d add this just element to the transition, we are actually controlling additional systemic and systematic risks that exist with transition. So transition is very important, green transition, because it eliminates certain risks, but actually it adds different risk, especially uh, in the social sector or social sphere. So if we do the transition in a just way, we actually find a you know, magic trick to actually control for those additional risks that might appear. And by reducing them, we actually improve the financial system in one additional way, apart from only looking at the, the environmental factors. Thank you. You, Katrina. Mm, yes, hello. Perhaps I can start by um, a short introduction of the International Labour Organization that I'm working for, for those who might not be aware about it. So it is a specialized UN agency with a mandate to promote uh, decent work. And we work not only with government entities, but also non-state entities and including the financial sector. Uh, that is the role of the social finance program that I make part of. And we work with banks, insurance companies, and uh, investors uh, around uh, the topics of how financial capital can um, promote positive change in the world of work. 
And obviously, the topic of just transition is very important for the organization because of important uh, connections between climate change, climate transition, and uh, labor rights and employment implications. And financial sector is actually one major enabler which uh, can help to support just transition and climate transition as such, as Piotr was just mentioning. Uh, I would just want to add um, another perspective to what Piotr just mentioned, is uh, that we all know by, uh, that uh, by estimates from G funds, uh, at least two thirds of climate finance is supposed to come from private, uh, private sources. Uh, so private sector financial institutions control uh, a lot uh, of these flows, and they have direct influence on the outcomes, including the so social outcomes through the activities that they choose to facilitate. And uh, they have a particular role to play instead of being a mere observer and uh, uh, just, uh, just feeling the uh, impacts wh which are being generated. And, and uh, yeah, that is, the way, what is why they need to uh, act. Thank you. We'll come back in the next round to understand a little bit more about what the ILO is doing. But before we do that, Miguel, your, your one minute take on Just Transition. Actually, have two because there is one panelist that didn't show up, right? So can I take her? You can have an extra minute. Okay. Yes. You combine that with inviting a Spanish a Spanish person to a panel after lunch. That is a killing combination, <laughs> right? So you're with me. So uh, just transition. What it is um, and why it's relevant to the finance industry. We, we a few days ago we learned about the, the, the synthesis report of the technical dialogue on the global stock take, and that it very clearly says we are nowhere close to reach the goal of two degrees temperature limitation, even less 1.5. And that it also mentions that to get uh, close to that goal, we need to make uh, emissions peak very, very soon. Incline full electrification, working away from fossil fuels, uh, stop deforestation, etc. Level, if you think of the level of transformational change that that implies, we can think of two things. The fantastic opportunities that it can create for green jobs, for development of new industries and innovative business models, but also the risks and the challenges of doing that. The socioeconomic impact of all of those transformations needs to be uh, assessed and need to be properly managed. We are not talking about only losing jobs. We are talking about government revenues because they will lose tax and they will lose royalties from fossil fuel industry, etc. So just transition is uh, to find a way of maximizing the opportunities and properly managing those potential negative impacts. Why it is relevant to the finance industry is because in that transformational change, the level of financing opportunities is there and has been mentioned this morning uh, many times of the trillions of uh, dollars of finance that we need. But also because as was mentioned before, there is a risk attached to the transformation that we have al already seen. We, we saw a few years ago the social unrest in, uh, in as close as uh, France, uh, provoked by changes in, in tax and uh, rates. We've seen that in developing countries like Mexico. We've seen that recently in Asia also. So that's also a risk for the finance industry uh, in the sense that those investment operations you are involved in can be disrupted because of the social unrest. So we need people and society to understand that this is good for them, that this can bring opportunities, and that no one will be left behind, especially those vulnerable groups, because a combination of government action and private sector support will take care of them. Thank you so much. Um, you, Katrina, tell us more about what the ILO has been doing. The ILO really focuses on decent work and thinks about decent work from, from different perspectives. The ILO also sits on the uh, civil society advisory body of for the, the banking board and the principles for responsible banking. So you bring, the ILO brings the voice of workers um, to the table when thinking about these issues in the banking sector. Um, but what are some of the specific things that the ILO has been doing on just transition? Okay. Um, so the ILO is a specialized UN agency with a focus on decent work and quite a unique uh, particular structure. 
um, between the UN agencies. It consistently includes workers, employers, organizations, and governments, uh, which are unite and, uh, and collaborate on the topics related to labor and employment related issues. Uh, the functions of the ILO is uh, to convene these three types of organizations uh, to set standards, labor standards in our, in our case, and they are doing it together in order to make sure that the standards are relevant, implementable, and uh, agreed by the parties, right? And uh, they support dissemination of these standards and implementation them, of them on different levels, on international levels, uh, uh, during uh, different international forums, uh, doing country work with governments, uh, uh, on defining uh, climate policies and integrated just transition considerations within uh, and uh, developing different support measures to enable the just transition, but also supporting private sector by capacity building, by developing tools, uh, by producing research uh, which uh, uh, brings to light the social impacts of uh, the climate transition. Uh, so the just transition topic is of high priority and the organization has been working on it already for several years. In 2015, uh, the constituents of the ILO uh, adopted the ILO Just Transition Guidance, which is a um, framework document uh, aimed at governments as well as workers and or employers organizations and outlines uh, some practical steps for them to uh, take into account in uh, implementing climate uh, strategies and policies. Um, uh, we, yes, we work on operationalizing uh, just transition guidelines, not only with the governments, but with the private sector as well, and the fi financial sector being one of the key stakeholders. So we also started a, de a dedicated work stream a couple of years ago, and uh, we realized that uh, there was some appetite for guidance and uh, for explaining what just transition is and what can it represent uh, for the financial sector. Uh, we started last year by teaming up with, ILO, uh, with LSE Grantham Research Institute to develop a just transition finance tool uh, aimed at banking and investing activities. Uh, and uh, the document is in open access uh, on the ILO site, so perhaps you can have a look at it uh, to see some initial information. Uh, what we did there, we um, we trying to explain what just transition is and what some what what practical actions financial institutions could take, uh, linking them to, uh, to operational processes within financial institutions. We also showed examples of some emerging practices, even though they are not abundant yet, and uh, gave links to, to some useful resources. Uh, so this year, we are scaling up this work, and we are actively collaborating with UNEPFI and uh, the members of uh, UNEPFI, uh, with Pelt, and Lendi, for instance, um, on developing additional guidance. Uh, this time we are focusing on banking and insurance activities, uh, insurance from the um, risk transfer and risk management perspective angle. We aim to explicitly include uh, adapt climate change adaptation angle in there and show even more tangible examples for financial institutions to follow uh, in addition to uh, different levels of guidance. Uh, we build on the, expertise, on the expertise of the ILO and UNEPFI, but also on a group of external experts, uh, academy, uh, academy think tanks, uh, development financial institutions, as well as a consultative committee of private sector practitioners, banks, and insurance companies, uh, whom we would want uh, to help us with the reality check of some recommendations as well. We will uh, present this report uh, at COP28. Uh, it will take, uh, the event will take place at the uh, Just Transition Pavilion, co-hosted by uh, the ILO and the European Commissions. And we will open the report also for external consultations. So we will be happy uh, to hear your perspective on uh, the recommendations uh, at that point of time, uh, but also if you would like to share some of the practices you might have in mind or something that you're already doing, we will be very happy to, uh, if you reach out to us ahead of, uh, ahead of the launch. And yes, uh, so far it has been a very fruitful collaboration and I hope, uh, uh, yeah, it's just the first step. Thank you. Um, I think that's something Unipify does really well is it brings these different groups of people together to co-create very practical tools that can be implemented in your organizations. And I think um, looking forward to that report being published um, at, at COP28. And if you're going to COP28, visit the Just Transition Pavilion. Because as, as we're all um, emphasizing, without a just transition, there won't, won't be a transition. Um, 
this need for it to be practical, I think, is, is really, really important. As I said, it's something that's easy to talk about. It's kind of, you know, just transition, fairness, leave no one behind. But when you actually get into this and you start to think about the different stakeholder groups that are impacted positively and negatively, especially in the short term, it's a complex web of relationships and stakeholders um, to navigate. And if you're an insurer or an investor or a bank, you're also one step removed from a lot of those because it's, it's the, the underlying business that's making some of these decisions. So, uh, Miguel, you, you've done some interesting work with the African Development Bank looking at issues around transition, just transition, building some of these things into lending, lending decisions. And I think perhaps there may be some lessons from that experience that would be useful to share for commercial banks. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. <clears throat> so there, there are two different examples I, I would like to elaborate on a little bit. One is African Development Bank and how the institution has uh, developed an internal just transition framework. But also maybe take a few minutes to, to go through the relevance of early call retirement processes and how just transition is is also critical there. Um, so for the African Development Bank, they have um, established internally a just transition framework that uh, yeah. looks at every single operation of the bank and how it has incorporated a set of just transition principles or fundamentals that are uh, taken into account the ones uh, by ILO, but adapted to the African context because uh, it's not subject uh, of what we are discussing now, but you can imagine that uh, just transition is very different in many different places, and in Africa there are many particularities and different countries that need to be taken into account. So um, the bank has established this just transition framework. Uh, each single operation needs to be assessed looking at that framework, and it placed each uh, investment uh, operation in that just transition continuum, right? It uses a, a scale that serves to ensure that um, these uh, social opportunities has been properly maximized and mapped and are being realized through the project implementation when we are looking at climate projects. So we are, we are looking at climate mitigation and ad adaptation projects, how they, how they maximize the social opportunities, and equally important how uh, the proper socioeconomic impact assessment has been done to manage and implement mitigation actions of those potential negative impacts. The, the idea also uh, is to start working with the project officers and project managers to increase the level of capacity and technical understanding of what just transition is. At the medium term, it will have, uh, bring the opportunity of air marking just transition finance. I think it will not be long that we see financing institutions air marking just transition finance as Many of you are already earmarking uh, Paris Aligned uh, financed. And also um, is very relevant to see how that framework is being used to um, work with intermediary banks, the regional banks, local banks that um, bring opportunities to the African Development Bank headquarters for financing, how it's being used to actually um, those intermediary banks get involved in making sure that those just transition principles are embedded in the project design from early stages of identification. Um, the, the other pro type of project I was mentioning, uh, early uh, cold retirement is happening in many countries. As uh, you can see, I'm sure you heard of just energy transition partnership is one of the investment lines they promote. And the concept is how do we make sure that, how do we promote and work on um, retiring coal uh, earlier than the lifetime left for the different operating assets. And the reality is very different in, in different countries, but if you look at Asia, for example, where we have helped the Asian Development Bank to integrate just transition in this mechanism that they call the energy transition mechanism, uh, if you look at the fleet of coal-fired power plants in Asia, it's relatively young. How can we accelerate that uh, retirement? So the financial mechanism works uh, by uh, putting together public and private finance to uh, restructure the debt 
on the assets and be able to gain between seven to 10 years of uh, life that, uh, lifetime that makes the asset operation to be still uh, profitable for the original asset owner, move the asset to a new asset operator that is able under the new uh, debt conditions to exploit it for a shorter time and still having a, a decent return. In parallel, that mechanism promotes investment in renewable energy to the new asset owner and the previous ones. So here we have two fantastic things getting together, right? Uh, when I talk about opportunities of a just transition, the reality is, uh, we heard this morning already from the International Energy Agency that uh, fossil fuels peak is, is coming uh, by 2030, right? Is the new estimation they released this morning. So these people were going to be out of a job no matter what. What this type of mechanism uh, allow us to do is to do that in a more orderly manner and to be able to put together um, the action of the private sector and the government to uh, promote and develop new opportunities for those uh, people whose jobs were going to be impacted. If you look at this type of actions, when you get an asset and you try to retire early, you will have direct impacts on the workers, but more importantly, you will have indirect and induced impacts on the economy, especially if you are talking about retiring 20, 30, 40, power plants in five to 10 years time. How do you manage that? That's the reality of, that is where just transition has a role to play. And that is where the cooperation between the private sector and the public sector is paramount. You cannot make an asset owner responsible for taking care of what's happening in, along the supply chain in a mine that is in a different state or even a different island or taking care of the transportation of the, or the workers of the transportation systems. You need a cooperation between those asset owners and the local governments and the central governments promoting policies and funding to make it an, a, a process that is done uh, in an orderly fashion, right? So um, maybe not a detailed uh, description, but here we see on, on this type of early retirement processes how it promotes opportunities again by handling the, the, the impacts early on, but also the importance of the finance sector, private sector, and the government and the public sector to cooperate and make sure that the long-term and uh, impacts are taken into consideration. Thank you, Miguel. I think a fascinating experience in working in some of these regions and definite lessons to bring back to Europe. Turning now, uh, Peter, to a country that has a lot of coal, and so issues around just transition are really, really um, at the front of, of, of your economy, your country, um, and your organization has, um, from the insurance side, has put just transition as one of its top priorities. Please could you share with us why, that, why you did that, how you did that, and, and how it's progressing? Thank you. Yeah, so it's it's not a surprise that actually just transition um, topic came up during the COP in Poland in, in Katowice uh, for, for obvious reasons. So maybe just to give you a little bit of context. So so PZ2 is by far the largest insurance company in Poland and Central Eastern Europe. It's like 40% of the market. Uh, I'm representing the asset management arm, which is the investment arm of the insurance company. So I'm focusing on, uh, on that side mostly. Uh, and why is it relevant, as I said? we are like a very big fish in this, in this pond. So the whole idea, you know, or maybe not the whole idea, but the potential idea of how finance could really streamline transition was about um, investors, banks actually seeing that, you know, they have to divest or move away from certain companies and promote those that are actually adopting the transition. And in this way, we are achieving uh, the transition. Obviously, there's one missing element to it. If you are divesting, what happens with that? You know, is there a social cost around that? Are there jobs that have been lost, et cetera, et cetera? So I think just transition element or just transition part adds this missing piece to the whole 
equation. And it's especially relevant if you're a big institution that has certain responsibilities in the economy. And it's not like you can divest because something hits you the other way, either in insurance or somewhere in investment or somewhere else, right? So you really need to work to improve the situation. And as I said earlier, it's not only about being responsible for your um, economy, for your community, for, for, for the region you're operating in. It also makes absolute sense from finance investment perspective, because this way you are actually addressing uh, risks. So if there is a risk of social unrest, if there is a risk of social cracks, it's something that hits the price as well. It's not only just hits the news. It's also something that is negative for, for returns. And in the end, investment is all about managing risks and returns, right? This is what we do, people, whether in banking or in investment funds, insurance companies, these are the two sides of the equation. So maybe focusing a little bit on the, on the risk side, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the catalog of risks, you know, you, you, you mentioned as well, my colleagues here, uh, different things that can go wrong. But by addressing this in a systemic way, we, we actually all benefit from it. So the whole marketplace improves because if we find the frameworks to actually address those risks, this means that more and more institutions can put it into their strategies, into their scorecards, etc. So by rule, this is something that, you know, for instance, there is a there's very interesting pieces on investment if somebody is interested from John Lukomnik, which is called beta activism, for example, right? So by simply taking certain risks into account by more and more actors, we're actually improve the risk profile of the whole market. So it's it's actually beneficial. Also, if you have a pension plan in place within this economy or a different one. So it actually makes sense from finance perspective to take into account social aspects of the transition because you are controlling or addressing certain risks. That's, I think, very important. I think you also, Miguel, mentioned the opportunities aspects, which is this returns. This is the one I really love to focus on uh, because it's actually it, it, it's the exciting part. Risks are, are always important but opportunities are, are what is really exciting. So, uh, as my colleagues also mentioned, I think this whole transition uh, notion, and I'm really encouraged by the fact that, you know, during this conference, I think transition is, is the main topic. Like, in every single panel, we are talking about transition. So, this is something I was already feeling, you know, a few years back, is supposed to come back. So, there was a moment when there was an um, idea to introduce transition bonds. There are a few there in the market. It never really picked up. And my bet, honestly, is that in two, three years' time, perhaps transition bonds is going to be actually a significant part of the market. Whether it's going to be labeled this way or not, we'll see. But I think the introduction of mandatory transition plans will actually allow for that to happen. So we'll have the framework on which we can base and actually build those products. So what I wanted to say, transition will be a mainstream part of finance, one way or the other. This is how, how I see it. Um, and because of that, the just transition aspect is going to be as relevant as it could be, simply because it's going to be the, the simply large part of, of financial sector. So as I think Mrs. Uh, Botin uh, said today during the, the introductory panel, that obviously the idea that we focus only on the green part makes the brown part less likely to transition. And looking at the impact side of the equation, actually the potential delta or the incremental improvement, however we, we calculate it, carbon footprint, you know, we can have different calculations, could be much more significant if we focus on the, on the transition uh, from brown, right? Whether we get to green, it depends on the industry, on the sector, the pace. Obviously, the devil is in the detail, but for many reasons, it makes absolute sense to focus on the part that need to transition, rather than on those that are already there or could be there very, very easy, right? So I think it's, it's very relevant that money actually gets streamlined there. On the global perspective, uh, Miguel was mentioning Africa. There, there are very interesting initiatives. For example, ASCOR initiative that is looking at developing a framework for investing in developing uh, sovereign bonds as well, so that if we are uh, making a product or, or investment strategy that is looking at sustainability as a target, we need to have this fairness element to it as well, because the most sustainable countries in the world are perhaps the richest countries in the world right now, because they can afford it. The countries that need to transition, uh, 
are the poor countries or middle income countries or developing countries also in Europe or regions in rich countries that have, you know, that are poorer or, or have more difficulties. So coming back to, uh, to, to kind of my, uh, my ideas, how, how I see that, how I'm trying to uh, develop that. One issue that we are facing that I think will be addressed, addressed soon with social taxonomy and those components and transition plans coming into place is that currently if you are, for example, in a market like Poland or even more so in, in Africa, for example, if I'm introducing an investment fund that is supposed to invest sustainably, it's much easier for me to make a product that is investing in Western Europe simply because there is data, there is framework, there's everything in place. It's much easier to fulfill the regulation, the standards, Article 8, Article 9, if you are doing that in the developed world. So we need to find ways to make sure that those products are relevant also in those economies that are more in need. The second aspect is, for example, we are now developing within the firm a, a, a strategy fund where we will be looking to, to streamline uh, investments that will be looking at real estate. And the, the purpose and the idea is to look at, at kind of brown type of real estate, which is not super sustainably, whether it's offices, logistics, whatever, uh, can be different, different topics, and transitioning into green. And within current uh, frameworks, as we are internally discussing SIMS, it's going to be impossible to position this as Article 9 fund even though it is really addressing the, the, the real needs and it should be seen as the, you know, the most advanced and proper product in the market. So, so it will probably end up as, as Article 8. And if we add the social layer to all of it, I think it will be even better if we can actually find and label those investments, those projects, those strategies that allow us to address the social component. So I'm quite hopeful, as I said. Uh, I think you know, in two, three years' time, when we have more of, of those frameworks in place, uh, transition finance will be booming in general. Money will be going that way, because currently the focus is still on mostly on renewables and the, and the kind of easy, easy fruits. This is how financial markets work. You know, we need to have clear targets and, and guidance. Um, and we will have this social component to it as to make it easier so that actually this transition happens. Because as I said, if we don't get it right, I think we'll just focus on those tiny bits that are gonna improve only slightly. And maybe just, just to share, you know, like why I think just transition is such a big topic and how I recently have seen that it's actually bigger than I thought before. So, so obviously, uh, we, after the, the war in Ukraine started, we had a huge energy crisis all across Europe. Spain obviously has been affected as well. Poland has been severely affected as well. And what you end up with is that, you know, people who can afford it or who could afford it earlier, they can put their solar panels on their roofs, right? People who can't afford it, they end up, you know, with paying much more for, for fossil fuels and they need subsidies, they need support, etc. So I think this is something we need to rethink uh, going forward and try to streamline actually those investments where they actually need it. Because you know, private sector, private investments, it already goes into, into a lot of those segments simply because it makes sense economically, as I said. There is, there is return, proper return, sufficient return. There are parts where it doesn't work, so I think blended finance is gonna be huge. So uh, multilateral development bank, they will have a lot, of, uh, a lot of work to do to drive this agenda, but I think private sector can't neglect it because, as I said, it's part of our agenda because of risk, returns, long-term view, and all the things we should look at. Thank you. Uh, lots of very important, interesting points there. Um, we do have some time for questions, so we're going to open it up and see if we do have any questions. I note two hands. Um, we'll get a mic to you. Um, if someone could... Uh, Butcher, Romy, sorry. Can we get a mic to, for our... Thank you. Um, so at the front first and then in the centre, in the middle. I think a couple of things. One, when we're doing climate risk scenarios, we talk about you know, the, the scenario of an orderly versus a disorderly transition. And an orderly transition has to be a just transition. 
You know, if it's, it means that we have to plan, we have to think ahead, and we have to think about who's affected. Otherwise, it won't be orderly. It will be socially disruptive, um, which is something we don't, we don't want. I think you've also highlighted that the concept of a just transition has a real geographical element to it, both between the global north and the global south, but within regions, within countries. And then also what uh, just transition can do is help us address uh, economic um, inequalities. So the, the example you use about the impact of the war in Ukraine is that you know, those people that can afford it can manage some of these risks whereas those that can't are further harmed by cost of living increases and, and, and higher energy costs. So just transition has to be about how do we have a more inclusive economic system overall. And then I think another point you make is that there has to be, there's lots of guidance, there's toolkits, there's collaboration, we can learn from each other, but the regulatory framework also needs to support just transition. And I think this morning we heard a little bit about some of the per perverse effects of, for example, focusing on a green asset ratio, rather than thinking about the need to actually finance decarbonisation means more money might be going to brown in, in the medium term. So just, just to touch on some points that stood out for me. First question, thanks. Thank you. Buchak and I from the European Banking Federation. Uh, so I missed uh, the very beginning of Ekaterina's, uh, so I'm sorry for that. Maybe this came up already then, but uh, my question will be about uh, the point that uh, Piotr made last, and maybe you also have a, an answer to this, which is about uh, what, part, what kind of uh, just transition activities are particularly relevant uh, for a private bank to finance uh, that makes sense, as Piotr said, uh, you know, financially. Um, so f just to stick with this example, I can see that, um, so if you say as a bank, I'm trying to um, help the ju just transition, so I will look a little bit more carefully at what kind of loans I'm making to retail clients, you know, households, for solar panels. So for instance, I get that, because the activity that you're financing is still essentially alone, you know, it makes sense. Uh, but what about uh, when you're closing down a power station, co coal power station, and, um, okay, when, you're, when people are retiring, of course, uh, that's for the government, I guess, to cover. Mm. But if, um, if you're reskilling them, uh, is, are, are they, does that lend itself to some projects that can also be covered with, by a, a private commercial bank? Um, if you know what I mean, so like when you're creating a new company, have you seen some examples? I, I'm most curious about that. Thank you. So let's take a round of three questions and then we can get our, our panelists all to give their input. So there's a gentleman in the middle and then one at the back and then we'll get, we'll get some answers. I think the one in the back was first, so I'm going to that one first. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Mayal Lagadek from uh, Sustainalytics. Uh, thanks very much for the panel. Um, I do have a question which relates to a topic which wasn't addressed, which is the training and rescaling of the workforce. Uh, because the, the, if we take, for example, the, um, the automotive industry in Europe, it has to transition from a combustion engine to a alternative um, energy to uh, power the, the vehicles. So how do you train the, the workforce? How do you contribute to that transition? Uh, and how do you make sure that this rescaling, reskilling, and upskilling of people also benefit the people who are at the moment out of employment, who are facing challenges to find employment, so that it doesn't only benefit to those who already are in jobs, because the purpose of also the transition is to create jobs. So if you create jobs for people who already have it, it doesn't support much. Good afternoon, Fermi Martinez from Santander. A very interesting panel, thank you very much. I wanted to ask Miguel on the, you know, he mentioned uh, the potential uh, of banks or institutions earmarking uh, financing for just transition. I wanted to ask how this will differ from traditional transition finance, whether, you know, he has any insights or any details of how this could be different. And then a, a wider reflection where I would welcome the, the opinion from the panelists is the just lenses just a tool to make sure that we have a successful transition? If you know, a, you know, a, a, a disorderly transition could be considered unsuccessful, 
and it's the just element, a, a tool to make sure that this is happening in, in the way it should be. Thank you. Great questions. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, you, Katrina, to go first, and then uh, Miguel and, and, and Peter. Thanks. Um, yes, maybe uh, answering the uh, first question first to the extent I can as well. Um, yes, governments have a role to play, and I do not think that we can expect uh, private sector financial institutions to take everything on board and to, to, to take care of all the activities, including risk killing, including social protection. Um, so, yes, we do not expect to do them directly, but at the same time, uh, a very important uh, role can be paid, played by partnerships, be through um, partnerships with public funds, for instance, as Petra alluded to, for instance, through blended finance solutions, uh, but also maybe to partnerships with governments and uh, with uh, local initiatives uh, uh, which are supporting a just transition, uh, be it reskilling, be it the new skills policies which are being developed also by different countries, and private sector providers providers can join forces, I don't know, with um, multilateral development banks, other development financial institutions uh, to, support, um, to support this purpose, uh, yeah, in, in, to the extent their commercial, uh, the, the, nature, the commercial nature of their activities allows that. Um, I, I heard an example from our colleagues from EBRD, for instance, with whom we working, worked on the guidance last year about the transition bond uh, that they uh, developed and uh, co-financed in Poland, uh, where uh, they were the main party developing it. Uh, we, we, we developed partnerships with uh, local authorities and local governments for, uh, for redeploying the workforce and reskilling it. And private sector capital providers could come in and co-invest with them, also contributing uh, to this project, to the realization of this project in a just manner. Yeah, thank you. Good questions. Uh, allow me first to say a link to what uh, Katerina just uh, said that just transition is one of those topics, maybe not the only one, but one of those topics that it will not happen without the cooperation between the private sector and private finance and the public sector. As I mentioned before um, in the example of cold retirement, if you map the type of impacts that you have in that process and the opportunities, but let's think of, of, of the impact. Uh, there are some of them that the private sector can deal with. As you mentioned, uh, people who are going to be retired anyway, they will be taken care of by the government. People who are terminated in the countries, you will have regulations, and normally it's the asset owner who will take on that. But then uh, there are uh, other type of impacts that are provoked by that intervention that happens far away or, or in there is a temporary and location mismatch between the impact and your project. For example, the impact on the transportation of coal because you are closing down your plant, or, it, uh, or the um, impact on the coal mining sector. That, there is no way the private sector is going to be handling those impact in isolation. And the government, most likely in some specifically emerging economies, may not have the skills or the capabilities or even the budget to take on those impact and manage them properly in isolation either. So if we want to do this in an orderly manner and be successful, we need the cooperation and there is a role for the private sector and for the public sector and it needs to be coordinated. It doesn't really matter how well you compensate the workers in your uh, specific plant, that if there is some unrest in the mining community where the plant is sourcing coal from, it's going to be a mess and you are going to be impacted. So we ne you need to make sure that not only you are doing your homework, but that you are engaging, as Katerina mentioned, with uh, the local government and with the national governments to make sure that the impacts along the supply chain and in different stakeholders are properly taken care of. So this private-public cooperation is key in the just transition. There was a comment or a question about how do you uh, do retraining, reskilling, how do you make sure that um, people without a job uh, has a priority, for example, to get a job, etc. I would say those are key basic elements of any 
reskilling retraining program, you need to think it wisely, right? So you need to, to, do, to use is data models um, to engage stakeholders. The, it, ha it hasn't been mentioned so much today, but we shouldn't forget of the relevance of a, a properly done stakeholder consultation process, right? How, who do we engage and how do we engage them to make sure that we have enough information and useful information to then be able to bring those opportunities to the right people. Mm -hmm. And reskilling and retraining is, for example, you think an area where this private-public cooperation um, is also needed. And not only that, where there are even financing opportunities to do that. If you think of a country that is heavily dependent on coal and you are going to retire the entire fleet in the next 10 years, there's obviously uh, business opportunities around retraining, reskilling those people and the promotion and creation of new green uh, industries. My, my last comment to the person from the Santander Bank and, and, and what positive is with the air marking. So um, I think it will be a, a similar process as we've seen for um, air market climate finance or Paris Align finance. Has it immediately led to more climate finance? Probably not. At the medium term, we've seen that because of society pressure, investor pressure, and different stakeholder needs to be uh, covered, there are more and more finance being channeled to that is climate finance or air market as climate finance or air market as Paris aligned. My feeling is that we will see the same in just transition air mark uh, finance. It will come through um, the demand from uh, um, donor countries when entering in blended finance operations. It's already, be, it's already there for uh, when you want to cooperate with philanthropies. The, many of them has now very high level the need for contribution to a just transition. And the society at different stakeholders will want to get information on what is being done on the just part of financing the transition. So by being an early mover in air marking just transition finance, you can lead that process and you can be better positioned to then um, cover the needs of those different stakeholders, donors, philanthropies, governments that they uh, want to prioritize those type of financing instruments. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, just, just maybe a few comments. I think um, when we talk about transition and this automotive industry example came by, I think it's quite interesting because there is a very, very good measure, I like it at least, which is called green complexity potential. I think it's developed by, by Oxford Economics. It basically shows you from the current industry what are the similar type of products with similar skills, supply chains, whatever you have that are within you know, this, this new let's say green industry perhaps. And with automotive industry, it's actually quite close because electric vehicles, obviously they are different. The engine is obviously different, but the rest of it is kind of the same, right? So if you replace the engine factory with a battery factory, bang, you, you, you get it right actually, and you find the jobs for, for the people. And this is what is actually happening by itself. So some, sometimes the market actually does work. So in the regions where we have uh, automotive industry, you also tend to see now uh, there is inflow of investments, for instance, into battery factories, which we see, for instance, in our region. So we're quite hopeful that this transition of automotive industry can actually happen quite, quite smoothly. Let's see, obviously, it's, it's, still, it's still ongoing. So that's one thing. So if you are looking for this reskilling, perhaps look for something that is relatively close. So that's, I think, the trick to get it right and, and to, to actually uh, to make it happen. So the supply chain stays. Uh, people have similar skills, etc. And the other bit is that, okay, sometimes it doesn't have necessarily have to be exactly the same thing, but if you have this industrial workforce that is in this traditional industries, there are new booming types of industries that are happening, and bang, you get semiconductor factories that spring around uh, Europe as well, fortunately, and, and these also get located in some of the places. So job creation is, I think, extremely important part because this is what people are the most afraid of. And the second, at least from my perspective in general, is energy security, energy, energy price security, and energy availability security. 
for heating, for, for working for SMEs, it's extremely relevant. So it's not only for housing, but also for small companies, small bakeries, etc. They need to be able to, to continue operating. So these are, these are relevant things. And regarding earmarking, I think it's been you know, the case when you observe sustainable finance, how it started, it was a little bit like you know, uh, industry itself was looking for ways to, 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 to do something, right? It wasn't ideal, but you, know, you observe the slow and constant flight to quality. And I think with environmental topics, we are already kind of fairly advanced. With social, it will be the same. But I agree, it's like this myopia or short-sightedness that you wait for the regulation to come and then you start complying. I think you should see this, this long-term risk element to it already, this long-term opportunity element to it already. As I said, this green complexity potential shows you a lot of great investment opportunities. So I think it's also something to, to look at if you're in the private sector because these are the places where actually you will be able to make decent returns and actually improve your risk profile, which is like the holy grail of finance, right? So, so let's look for those opportunities and Just Transition Lens actually gives you additional lens or tools or frameworks, which are in development, obviously not ideal, but, but we are getting there. Thank you. Um, I want to come back to the example on, in coal and you talked about the, the sort of supply chain around coal and the transportation of coal and I want to talk about South Africa, which is where I'm from, which is a coal dependent economy and uh, has a just energy transition plan led by the government where it's getting finance to decarbonize, to retire coal-fired power stations, and um, the funding is, is then to move into renewable energies, electric vehicles, and, and hydrogen. And it's gone through, this plan has gone through an extensive stakeholder engagement process where uh, a presidential commission has gone out to the regions where the power stations are, where the coal mines are, to really engage with communities. But there's so many vested interests in the existing economy and the existing economic relationships that some of the biggest resistance to renewable energy, which is a no-brainer in a country like South Africa, it's made for renewable energy, comes from the companies that transport the coal. Um, and they have formed very strong, powerful political voices which then lobby for restrictions on renewable energy and so on. And, and to the point where it's putting at risk this financial commitment that's been made from partners like the US and, and the EU. So it's, it's really important, I think, that we understand that a just transition is very much a political process. It's not just a technical or technological process and it's not just a, a financial process. And what's What's really struck me, I've recently relocated from South Africa to Europe, um, is how the issues around just transition are the same. And I always thought this was an African issue or this was a global south issue. It's not. It's all of our issues um, going through this. And in some ways, we've done the easy part on the transition. So it, the easy thing is to fund renewable energy. We're all doing it. Every bank is doing it. Um, it. It's not new. It's pretty old now. Um, the hard thing is this transition and, and moving away from the brown energy from the fossil fuels. And that's starting to, make, to impose costs on different groups in society. And we're seeing that pushback. And, and that's why the just transition concept has to be operationalized. So in wrapping up our panel today, what I'd I'd like to ask each panelist to very just quickly in, in your closing comment, what is the one practical operational thing our delegates here today could take back into their organization to make the just transition happen? So I'll start Peter and end with Miguel. So I, I think I mentioned finance is about uh, risk and return. Just transition is on both sides of this equation. It's as simple as that. It allows to address, control, measure, and somehow mitigate potentially systemic and systematic risks, uh, whether you're a bank or investment fund, that's one thing. And the other side is that there is simply an interesting potential in terms of just generating 
good investments that will work in the long run, which is something that we should aim for, especially in pension plans and stuff like that. And I think that's from my side. Katrina? Yes, yeah. okay, sorry. Uh, so um, no, maybe one message to take away it is that a just transition is not necessarily about reinventing the wheel, and it is about application of quite some established uh, social standards, safeguards, and practices uh, connected to, um, to the process of financing the climate transition. Uh, a lot of sustainable finance practices are already being put in place or are in place in particular in European context and it would be important to include this uh, social angle, the analysis of social impacts of the climate transition within. Um, I, I think it is a natural place to start because um, that's where a lot of efforts have been put already recently by the financial institutions. And secondly, it makes complete sense uh, in order to, um, to decide somehow the approaches to climate and uh, to social impact and uh, avoid uh, any adverse impact and the need to manage them in the aftermath as it might have happened if you just addressed one side of the equation. Thanks, Miguel. Thank you. Very interesting. Just building on, on, on my colleagues from the panel, I, you want to take one thing home is it's better to be an early mover as we have discussed about Ed marking that lagging behind. Um, just transition standards are around the corner. The requirements for disclosing information on just transition, so just transition disclosure requirements, and who knows, even a just transition taxonomy will come. It is better that start early, see this as an opportunity to uh, uh, maximize, as I said before, the opportunities of the transition, making sure that any potential negative impact doesn't really affect your financial operation. So this is going to happen. Um, go back home and start looking and reading about this. There will be some news on COP28 on some uh, bold movements on trying to bring the concept of just transition at the same level that environmental, social, uh, climate disclosure requirements are having now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for attending this post-lunch session. I hope you found it interesting. I definitely did. And I'm sorry we don't have more time because I think we could easily go for another hour and lots more questions from everyone. So just please join me in thanking our great panelists with a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.